This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, the special episode recorded on April 30th, 2019. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to the podcast all about viruses. We are back in Rotterdam, the Netherlands. We're back at the European Congress of Virology for our second episode. And at this meeting, there are virologists from over 50 countries, including some in the audience. I have another batch of T-shirts to throw out today. If you got one yesterday, please don't get another one, (laughs) unless you're planning on selling it. (laughs) You get a lot of money for them. (laughs) They're in high demand. And I've again grabbed a few guests from this meeting to talk about their careers and their viruses. And uh, joining me as my co-host today from Amsterdam University Medical Center, Ben Burkout. Yeah, hi, uh, Vincent. Welcome to TWIV, and thank you for joining us. And thank you for being a, a co-organizer with Marion Koopmans of this meeting. And uh, on my right here from Erasmus Medical Center, this is his third time on TWIV, Ron Fouchier. Great to be back, Vincent. I guess he didn't turn on your microphone. Oh. Welcome back, Ron. <laughs> In the middle from the University of Barcelona, Rosanna Girones. Is that right? Rosina. Rosina. Yes. Rosina. I have the wrong word written here. Okay. Rosina. Well, anyway, Rosina, welcome to TWIV. (laughs) Thank you. Thanks for joining us. And from INSERM, she's Director of Research, Marie Paul Keeney. That's right. Welcome to to TWIV. Thanks. And we're going to find out a little bit about the training of these uh, individuals and uh, how they got where they are today. So, uh, Ron, we've heard from you before, but let's remind everyone, tell us a little bit about your training. My training. I uh, studied microbiology in Wageningen in the Netherlands. Uh, And at the end of that training, uh, it became clear that HIV was caused, uh, uh, AIDS was caused by HIV. And I had the opportunity to start in Amsterdam, very close to where Ben is, uh, to get my PhD working on HIV. And then I moved to Philadelphia, as a postdoc to work on HIV for another four years with Michael Malin. And then uh, HIV uh, was curable uh, with, with, uh, with drugs, and I figured I needed to do something else. And so I moved back to the Netherlands and uh, started working on flu. And so the last 20 years I've been in Rotterdam working on influenza, uh, also some coronaviruses and SARS and MERS, and on paramyx of viruses. Do you remember when in your life you decided you wanted to do science? Uh, I've always been interested in, in science, um, but mostly physics initially. I, I, I like physics. I was very good in physics, and that was my career plan. But then uh, I, uh, I, I then, uh, went to Wageningen to check that out, and I like microbiology. And so that's when I switched when I was about 18. Rosina, how about you tell us a little bit about your training? Yeah, um, I studied at the University of Barcelona and did my PhD there. And then I moved to the NIH in Bethesda to, analyze, to study hepatitis uh, hepatitis B. And I was really nice uh, with Roger Miller and Bob Purcell. <laughs> Sorry, that's <the> co-host. <laughs> And, um, and then I came back to Barcelona to start my own lab, and I changed the topic uh, to analyze uh, the viral contamination environment, f- uh, virus transmitted through water and food, because uh, when I started my PhD, the level of contamination in the environment was really huge. And, uh, and it was nice for me to work on the medical side or more basic side, and then to work in the more applied one, because very often with our colleagues, 
they just study the viruses in the safety, biosafety cabinet. <laughs> and then you say, well, but this virus is it also in oysters or in the river. Yeah. And then I thought it was nice to try to write the whole picture. So I've been working all over those years on different viruses uh, that could be found out, outside, emerging, hepatitis E, food, um, uh, microbial tracking, markers, companies, all that. So I think it's, it's nice. And now, now I'm recently also a dean of the faculty, so I try too much <laughs> to, to keep <laughs> a little bit on everything. <laughs> yeah, so. Do you remember how far back you knew you wanted to do science? Yes, uh, I saw a nice film of Madame Curie <laughs> when I was <laughs> like 13 or something, and I thought that was nice. And, That's a uh, good inspiration. Yeah. Yeah. So easy. <laughs> right. Mary Paul, uh, tell us a little bit about your training. Well, being born in a family where everybody was a medical doctor, I wanted at all cost to, to go as far as possible from anything doing with medical education. So therefore, I started my studies to become an engineer in agronomy. And actually, I am an engineer in agronomy. But after a while, I thought that, frankly, driving a, tr uh, a tractor and trying to remember what to do to do decent agriculture wasn't for me. And so I took a side path and through, the, through uh, molecular biology, I came to, uh, to come closer and closer to health and, and medicine. So my first project, when I, when I um, worked after my PhD in, um, in Transgen, a biotech company, by that time in Strasbourg in France, my first project was to make a recombinant vaccine against virus, against rabies. So this was my first virus. And to make this vaccine, I worked with recombinant viruses. Um, like uh, vaccinia viruses and, and, and this put me on a path where actually I've been working on viruses nearly all my professional life. Um, after a few years then I, I, uh, I went out of lab research and I, I started a, a, a career in policy and I worked for 17 years with the World Health Organization and now uh, after retiring from uh, from uh, the organization, I'm, uh, I'm splitting my, my life between viruses, vaccines, and policy. Do you miss working in the laboratory ever? Uh, at the beginning, yes, but I think after so many years, if I would try, I think I would be very bad. I, I was reasonably uh, effective at that time. Yeah, well, if, if, it, if it were anything like me, if I went into my lab, they would throw me out, <laughs> right? Same with you. I'm not allowed in the lab anymore. No. <laughs> All right, so let's talk a little bit about uh, your science here. Uh, Ron, let's start with you. I wanted to talk about a recent paper you published on uh, the, the characterization, characterization of uh, H, influenza H2N2 antigenic drift. Yeah. So tell us why you, why you did this project in the first place. Well, there's a, of course, we know that influenza vaccines, uh, they work, but there's certainly a lot of room for improvement uh, in, in increasing the effectiveness. And, and so for the last 20 years, I've been working to understand how flu viruses drift, uh, what's causing that, and whether we can learn anything from it so that to the extent where we can actually predict what's going to happen next. And so the aim of, of, of all of that work that we've been doing is, is to try to predict the antigenic evolution of flu. And if you say that, then people tell you you're crazy, right? You can't pr predict how evolution is going to go. But I think we're getting close because we're now really understanding how which changes can make these viruses escape from antibody responses. And we, we think that we can, uh, yeah, we, we are gaining enough information now that we can predict this. Uh, but of course, we have to study various subtypes. So we've done it on H3, on H1, we're now doing it on flu B, and recently we did it on H2N2 to see whether those uh, uh, changes that are responsible for drift uh, are the same in different subtypes, and, and so to try to broaden the scope a bit from H3 and H1 only. So that was a virus that emerged in 1957, right? Before you were born, right? Before I was born, uh, and it stopped circulating just about the time I was born, so in 1968 it stopped. 
Uh, and it was really a time where there was not much surveillance yet for mm -hmm. flu, so there, there's not a lot of primary virus isolates available, but, but the Dutch National Influenza Center is one of the first in the world, and it was actually collecting samples already in the 40s and the 50s. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and when I came to Rotterdam, I found out that there's this, this liquid nitrogen tank that has been frozen all this time. Mm -hmm. I never thought it's very rare with n liquid nitrogen tanks to remain yeah. uh, in shape uh, for so long. And we were actually able to culture viruses from clinical specimens that were in that liquid nitrogen tank from the 40s, the 50s, the 60s. And so we've been thawing out some of these viruses. Mm -hmm and now uh, revisiting the antigenic drift of viruses from 1940 to, to the present day. That's the old freezer experiment. That's the old freezer experiment, yeah. And, and there's a lot of interesting material. So the first 1957 virus that's in that freezer was from the professor who ran the National Influenza Center there. He took a swab from himself and put it in the <laughs> freezer, and we could regrow that virus from it. You know, they put me in charge of my liquid nitrogen in my lab, and I went away for a few weeks and forgot about it. That's not good. We lost everything. Yeah. Uh -huh. All this, our cell lines. This freezer has been frozen since the 40s, so that's really impressive. For so D.A. D. A. Henderson once told me he was the first to pick up on the uh, 57 uh, pandemic. It originated somewhere in China, right? Yes, yes. But as you said in the paper, there wasn't much surveillance, so it took a no. while for us to figure out what was going on. That's right. And... and but of course, this, uh, these professors then in Rotterdam, they took the swaps from themselves yeah. and stored the material. And so later they, they were able to isolate viruses. Okay, so you, you studied the antigenic drift. What are the approaches? What did you do? Well, so the, the, the standard way of, of looking at drift is, uh, is raising ferret antisera against these viruses and then do these huge cross titrations with multiple strains and multiple sera that were raised against uh, uh, those different strains, and then you make a huge cross uh, table. And, and this, this HI assay, hemagglutination inhibition assay, it correlates well with virus neutralization assays for flu. So we always go back and confirm that our HI data are in fact representing neutralization data. Um, and so you get these huge tables with numbers. Uh, and when I started in Rotterdam in 1998, I just told you I, I started on H HIV. I didn't know anything about these big tables. And I figured that if I was going to work on flu for the next 10 or 20 years, I better use, develop some algorithms to interpret these tables uh, for me. And so I worked with uh, bioinformaticians in Cambridge to develop methods to interpret quantitatively these, uh, these HI tables. And we call this uh, a visualization an antigenic map. And so it's, it's essentially the same as using a phylogeny uh, software to interpret sequence data, which you cannot do by eye, really. Uh, and, and, but we, we use this, these HI tables to make maps where different dots are viruses and different other dots are sera. And the distance between viruses and sera relates to the HI titers or the VN titers. This is antigenic cartography. Antigenic right? cartography, <laughs> yes. And so in, in one side, you see how viruses drift. You see groupings of viruses, viruses that are phenotypically the same. And, and you can quantify the drift. So you can really look at the rate of drift. And so this is stuff that's really hard to get out of, out of the primary virus neutralization data or HI data, but you can get it easily from these maps. And so that also helps you to then uh, determine the molecular determinants, right? So you can take a virus in one cluster and a virus in the second cluster, and you can put mutations that are different between them. You put them in one strain, and you see if the strain moves to the next cluster. Mm -hmm. And that's what we've done for H3, for H1, for we're doing it for B, and recently we published on H2. So if I, from reading your paper, it looks like H2 is a little less variable than the others, right? Yeah, H2, uh, well, of course, it only circulated for 12 years, from 1957 to 1968. And uh, in that time, it, it, it moved, just like any other flu viruses would drift, this one did too. But it did so slowly, much slower than H3 and 2. So I think the rate was about three times slower for H2. H3, I think, is the unusual guy here, right? So flu B drifts slowly, uh, H1 drifts slowly, H2. And H3 is the fastest one of them all. So I think H3 is actually the oddball in the group. But, but you mentioned that uh, they all undergo the same genetic 
variability, right? So, but so why is the antigenic variability different? Well, I, I, I th yeah. So, so if you look at the rates of genetic evolution, so in phylogenetic trees, you see that all these viral viruses um, uh, evolve as fast as the other. But uh, in terms of drift, the H2 is much slower, and we think that the H2 protein is less capable of. Uh, of taking these amino acid substitutions around the receptor binding site without taking a, a, a true hit on the intrinsic fitness of the virus. And this is, of course, now the key question for us is, is, is how does, do these changes around the receptor binding pocket, how does that relate to changes in intrinsic virus fitness? Because, of course, this receptor binding pocket is very important for the virus. It needs to attach to the epithelial cells in our airways. And you cannot change too much but you have to change something to escape from population immunity. And so there's this balance between immune escape, but still maintaining the power to, to bind to the epithelium. And I guess that's slightly different for different hemagglutinins. And you didn't find any changes in the stalk, right? No, the stalk is a highly conserved uh, part of the hemagglutinin, um, also because it's not so accessible to antibodies. Uh, the head is, of course, sticks out the most, and it's very accessible to antibodies. Mm -hmm. And the stalk is, is hidden under that big head, and therefore there's little, less drift on the, on the stalk. So it, it was replaced in 1968 by H3N2, right? And I always wondered why, so today we have H3N2 and H1N1 co-circulating, right? Why didn't H3 and H2 co-circulate? Do you have any ideas about that? No, that's, that's completely unclear. Um, but the, the, same, the same story holds true for the flu bees. Huh? So in, in, in the 80s, there's this, this split of the flu bee lineage into two sublineages, the Yamagata and the Victoria lineage. And using our freezer database of viruses, we're now also revisiting that. So what happened exactly? Why were the, those two uh, viruses generated? And how can it be that those both continue to circulate? Because you would expect one to die out because there's only one going to be the, the real fit virus. But in this case, there's this uh, divergence into two lineages, and until today we have them both. And so that might be a very similar scenario as having H1 and H3 at the same time, right? And so that's why we are investigating this flu B emergence. So is H2N2 gone, or is it somewhere still? It's not in people as far as we know, right? No, there's still H2 in birds, and so there's always a chance that it will be back at some point, right? So if it, if it jumps from birds to pigs, and then from pigs to humans, or something like that. Uh, and it's still around in a lot of freezers. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think uh, with H2N2 uh, viruses, uh, the, the freezer that I just described is a dangerous freezer, of <laughs> course, right? It, it needs to be put away because uh, we don't want those viruses to get in yeah, loose. Yeah, sure, sure. But the, the same H2N2 that circulated in people, is that in animals somewhere, do you think? In birds, maybe? No, the ancestor is. The ancestor. The ancestor okay. the, so the H2 pandemic started, of course, uh, as all flu pandemics from an avian source originally. And, uh, and in, in birds, these H2 viruses are still uh, highly prevalent. And they're not just H2N2, but also H2N8 and H2N3. Mm-hmm. Sure, all of those. In fact, you mentioned in your paper that antibodies in the human population to H2 is waning, right, as the population ages. Yeah. So, so why is that a worry? Well, it's a worry. So, so the, the people in my lab, they, they were all born after, way after the H2N2 <laughs> pandemic. See, I, I was on that edge, but all the people in my lab uh, were from the 70s and the 80s. And so they have no antibodies to the H2. Of course, the N2 is shared between the H3N2 viruses and the H2N2, so there might so still be some cross-reactivity, but H2 antibodies are not uh, present in most of the audience as we see it here today. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the elderly, you know, people that were born before 1966. <laughs> I was. I, <laughs> I'm also the elderly in this uh, respect. Um, their antibodies, of course, are waning simply because these people haven't been reinfected with, with H2 right. and viruses since. So. And, and so you say that's why there are some candidate vaccines for H2? Yeah, the, the, there's, I think there's even been a call by, uh, by folks at the NIH to, uh, to start to stockpile an H2 vaccine or even perhaps to you know, give H2 and 2 vaccine to some people. 
uh, just to be prepared. I think that's a little bit uh, too much because flu vaccines are also expensive. But it's good to have some prototype candidates on the shelf so that in case uh, this virus is back, then we, we can vaccinate against it. Because uh, we do know that H2 viruses can cause a pandemic yeah. because yeah. they've done it before. They did it. So. But you would want to have a match between whatever reemerges and your vaccine, right? So. Yeah, but the, so the, what's interesting is, uh, so we've also been doing this antigenic analysis of, of viruses from birds of all subtypes. And what you see is that in birds, these antigenic phenotypes are very stable. So there is no antigenic drift in, in, in avian HA. So if you take the H2 from 1957, mm -hmm. it's the same as the H2 that's now in birds antigenically. And so if we now take a, a 2019 avian H2 as a vaccine that, yeah, that would have yeah. protected in 1957 right. and the other way around. So, so, so the, one, the H2s in birds now, do they, they resemble the 57 vintage of, and not the 67 vintage? That's right. That's wow. right. So antigenically, they are identical to the 1957 H2. But if you made a vaccine... Genetically, they're very different by now. Huh? Oh, and the assumption is that if something reemerged, it would be from birds, so it would look yes. like 57. That's right. That's right. Okay. One thing you said in the paper, which I found interesting, is that people born before 1957, much before, I guess, I was born in 53, but I wouldn't fall into this category. They have antibodies to H2N2, even before the outbreak. So where do they come from? Well, there's the, uh, there's the, 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 the uh, recycling hypothesis of flu viruses. <laughs> so it goes H1, H2, H3, H1, H2, H3. So I, I personally don't think that that's the only options that flu has. <laughs> uh, but surely, over the last 100 years, that's all we've seen. Um, and so there's some historical data also coming from Rotterdam, from the first National Influenza Center, uh, serology data, showing that people that were born around the turn of the 20th century uh, were seropositive for H2 and prior to that, H3. And so serological, seroarchaeological data suggests yeah, that yeah. there have been a recycling of those subtypes before hmm. uh, last century. Because as far as we know, one, two, and three are the only HAs that that's will right. infect people, right? See, and that's why some people say that H5 or H7, we shouldn't be worried about because it's going to be only one, two, and three. Uh, you never know, right? I, do, I don't think that that's true. Viruses don't follow human prediction. That's right. That's right. But since we have H1 and H3 circulating, then the logical is that the next pandemic will involve an H2, right? Yeah. Does that make sense? Or? Well, that's, that's one of the options. And as I just said, the, there are still frozen uh, vials out there everywhere, and we have to make sure that that's not going to cause the next pandemic. Yeah. See, because that's what's happened, I think, in the 70s. People were trying to make uh, life attenuated vaccines and doing human challenge studies, and that's that might be the, the, the way the H1 virus re-emerged in the 70s. Mm. So p some people say it's, it's a lab accident. I don't believe that. I think it's actually human challenge studies and attenuated, life attenuated vaccines mm -hmm. that reverted that are the likely candidates of the 1970 yeah. re-emergence of H1. And we have to make sure that that doesn't happen again with H2. Yeah, so that's why we have H1N1 circulating now. That's right. Well, no, the, now we have pandemic oh, that's H1N1. Right, it's a different one, one even, yes. It's a different one. So from 77 to 2009, we had a, a different H1N1 than we have to, today. And that one's gone now. That one's back in our freezers. Yeah. Now, you're telling me that HIV was too complicated? <laughs> For you, and that's why you switch. This is way more. No, HIV is not too complicated, but through a lot of research at that time, uh, antiviral drugs were yeah. made, and HIV could be dealt with controlled, much better than yeah. flu. I think. Right, uh, controlled. Okay. All right. Well, that's cool. Someday we'll get you back, and we'll talk about avian surveillance. Sure. But in the meantime, take care of that freezer, right? Yes. <laughs> it's it's locked away carefully, and these viruses only come out in our BSL three plus. All right. Rosina, you, you're interested in viruses in the water. Yeah. How, how do you study viruses in the water? Tell us. Yeah, well, we started by uh, checking um, uh, risk for the population related to viral contamination. So uh, we started by analyzing 
highly polluted areas years ago, and now we still we continue working with water, um, different aspects. Initially, when you want to test virus in water, you need to concentrate because are, of course, diluted. And, um, and also, if you try to work with food, for example, that's even more difficult because you also need to concentrate and those matrices are complicated. But uh, in water, there are many different methods nowadays for concentrating virus, so it shouldn't be any problem. We had uh, ultra filtration systems. We have a nice... We use a very simple method for recreation water, for example, which is uh, organic flocculation with skim milk. Yes, yeah, skim milk it's flocculation. Really, <laughs> it's really cheap and uh, doesn't give you much work. You just let the flocules steering for several hours and then just collect them. And, and the uh, viruses are binding to that. Yes, wow. exactly. Virus is an organic protein uh, flocculation. So virus attached to the flocks, and then you just collect the flocks, centrifuge, dilute, and you get all the virus from 10 liters in a, a couple of mLs or something like that. And uh, But yeah, so I think now it's feasible and it shouldn't be any problem of, for testing virus. And then you extract nucleic acid and do next generation sequencing, yeah. is that right? Yes, we can do, if you want to test infectivity, you can also do that. Okay. Or if you want to do nucleic acid extraction and metagenomics, whatever. And some concentration protocols, you can concentrate simultaneously bacteria, protozoa, and virus, so you can go more further to, to check what is there. You, you published a paper called Keto's Virome. To call what? Keto's Virome, probably I'm pronouncing it wrong, the capital of Ecuador. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> name, I like the name of that <laughs> paper. So that was viruses in urban streams, right? Yeah. Yeah, because uh, to check for urban sewage mm -hmm. or for uh, wastewater treatment plants in many countries is not uh, easy because they don't exist in many countries still. So yeah, in Quito we tested channels and yeah. So what in that kind of a situation, what's the major kind of virus that you would find in the water? Yeah, let me tell you, the virus we, use fi we used to find in the water are similar in many places. Uh -huh. So, of course, there are areas where it's more endemicity for hepatitis A, and then you may find more hepatitis A or more enteros, depending also the time. But the variability between when you study sewage is it's depending on many things, you know, the time of the day, mm -hmm. the type of sample, the, if it's a wastewater treatment plant, how many inhabitants. Uh, because the mixture makes it, you could find many more viruses than in big ones compared to small ones. So the period of the year, of course, because there is seasonality. Yeah, so all those are things that you need to keep in mind. But if you want to test uh, could be what could be the risk for the population, testing sewage is a good way to know what virus are circulating. Yeah. And then, then I guess that the number one catch will be bacterial phages. Is that true? Yes, it's true. Yeah, the most abundant bacteriophages. And in the initial studies, we were also surprised to find so many plant viruses, which is really an exciting thing because all these plant viruses and even phages, we are finding now them in serum samples, human serum samples. So it looks like the intake in our body is more than a specific receptor or an infection. And there are many questions that are still open. And I think some of them may be really positive. For example, vegetable virus should be positive. I mean, it's good to eat vegetables, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's what they say, <laughs> yes. Then probably it's related to all these plant virus that we eat and then stimulate our immune system without infecting, which is really a nice thing to do. <laughs> what did someone say? Eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Yeah, right. That's, that's what, right. That's the way it goes. So the plant viruses are coming from what people eat. Yes. And so most of the viruses in the water is coming from fecal contamination, right? But I think you found in one paper there was some contribution from urine as well, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's surprisingly when we test urine, it's mainly DNA virus, mm -hmm. which is nice to see this difference, no? And yeah, so you find polyomas, of course, and you find papillomas. Papillomas, also. right. Whereas fecal 
contamination is what I want to say picornaviruses, right? Is, or enteroviruses. Is that the biggest one? Uh, I will not say the no. biggest one, but there Besides are many. Besides what's next? Well, it's, it's hard to say in terms of quanti quantification, but uh, let me say uh, sometimes with the metagenomics, we don't really quantify. So I'm not able to tell you which ones are the most abundant. We can make some relative assumptions, but when we do quantify between pathogens, I will say uh, norovirus, maybe higher, but very regularly, but maybe really high. And then adenoviruses are used to be high and are used to be constant. So it depends on the, and picornas, for sure, we find many picornas, but also it's variable too, yeah. No, I just want Astrovirus are very common. I just want picornas to be high because I've worked on them my whole career. Yes, so, no, they they're really be, nice but and diverse. <laughs> I was surprised in the Ecuador study, you didn't find any polio virus because, you know, we, I'm sure they're immunizing with OPV there. The infectious vaccine and usually you find that yes and, yes but you didn't usually you find there if you uh, vaccinate uh, not so young babies mm -hmm. because if the babies use diapers <laughs> then the virus go to the diaper and that goes somewhere else right yes it theoretically doesn't... speaking yes theoretically <laughs> You don't want to flush those down the toilet, do you? <laughs> Normally not. <laughs> Although my daughter recently flushed a banana peel down the toilet. <laughs> and that's not a good idea either. So when you do the next generation, you get reads, right? And so you're saying, even if you have more reads of a particular virus, that doesn't mean that's the most that's in there, right? Yes. Um, yeah, because you always have a bias. Although, of course, if you commonly get more reads of something and more diversity, you can extrapolate that that's one of the most abundant. But you, we always need to do an amplification, even if it's short, 25 cycles. I see. And that's introduce a bias, even if it's a random primers. Also, we know that the system we use for retrotranscription and the sequenase to tack the, mm -hmm. to mark the second strain, it's more efficient for RNA virus than for DNA virus, sure. and maybe yeah. more efficient for one for the other. So we can, we must consider that maybe some bias, yes. So is there any way that you could get more quantitative? Uh, well, some people do semi-quantifications, mm -hmm. but I'm not so, yeah, of course, you can do relative abundance, compare ones to the others with the cones, yeah. So one thing I'm always curious about when people do metagenomic virome analysis is how much of it is actually infectious virus as opposed to yeah. pieces, right? Yeah. Do you have any idea about that? Uh, well, we do um, DNAs, so we should destroy DNA that is free. I see. So one of the steps is to select for the viral, structured viral particles. But even though, of course, anytime we do a PCR for detection of a virus, we don't know if it's infectious or mm. not. We can make some approaches like this. If it's in a structured viral particle, then probably yes, it's infectious. Yeah. But uh, some experiments have been done with infectivity with many viruses, and it's amazing how far they could be infectious, mm -hmm. uh, including plant virus, which is one of my favorite topics recently. <laughs> you also screen lots of plant virus, and they are infectious, many of them. Mm -hmm. So we eat fruit from anywhere. And we screen virus from anywhere, mm, even yeah, if they yeah. pretend not to bring you some food from by the airport. <laughs> you just <laughs> right, eat it. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah, of course. So w what is one of the problems, I guess, in having viruses in sewage is that in many places they process and kind of reuse it for irrigation, right? Yeah. So can you, can you talk a little bit about the issues there? Yeah. Nowadays, uh, wastewater is considered as a product. Your not product. as a waste. Right. <laughs> and then nothing is a waste anymore. <laughs> so we need to recycle everything. And then it's a, a great source of phosphorus, nitrogen. So there is a, a lot of work going on to try to re recollect the phosphorus and the nitrogen and to be able to reuse the water safely. For irrigation, aquifer recharge, many different things, industry. So here we are. How can you guarantee the safety? of uh, this for aquifer charts and regulation. 
and irrigation, especially, for example, if you use it for aquifer recharge, we know that the virus could be there mm -hmm. for months or years stable because it's cold temperature, no UV. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So we need to really be careful with all those things. And there's so many viruses. And I think you mentioned that this, the processing does not get rid of many viruses, right? Yeah. And so, especially for irrigation, so it's going to get on the crops, right? Uh, yeah, well, yes. <laughs> if you don't uh, really uh, work on that, uh, yeah, for irrigation of many things uh, will be useful, but uh, for irrigation of fresh vegetables that we draw, we need to be really careful and probably many of the tertiary systems that we have in place will require an extra disinfection. Some include disinfection protocols, but the disinfection, you need to prove that it's enough efficient. You know, viruses are quite resistant to chlorine, especially if there is organic materials there that will combine with the chlorine. Also UV, it works very nicely, but you need to be sure that your UV lamp is working properly and that all the water goes through. So uh, it's a, also a question of good management and also sustainability. So of course we have technology to disinfect the viruses, but it's very expensive and we need to really provide with a system that will be sustainable, with, if it's positive ecologically speaking better, like a wetland, and then to try to, to manage systems that could be this balance between. Have you looked on crops for viruses? I think you published a partially paper, right? Yes. It's an <laughs> so, <laughs> That stuck out, virus, the, vi <laughs> the parsley virome. <laughs> so what did you find there? W what country was that in and what did you find? Well, the parsley paper was an experimental infection, let me okay. tell you. <laughs> okay. So uh, because, yeah, we did it. So we wanted to try to use river water and irrigate with a spray, uh, check, uh, check what happened. And then it was, yeah, we find... Uh, pathogens on the leaves. Uh, we didn't check infectivity, but uh, but we all know that uh, vegetables, if they are infected or contaminated, could be stable for a long time. And parsley is a problem because we all use parsley without cooking yeah, in right. many yeah. dishes, mm -hmm. and uh, they grow in the floor. So very often it's with uh, irrigation, which is a uh, spread. So there are some food that have higher level of problems. Also lettuce, for example, because they protect the water and the virus. It's a long, sur big surface. And also the virus may be protected from UV and then could be stable for quite a long time too. And once the virus is attached to the food, it's not so easy to clean. I mean, if you even clean the vegetable with su suspensions with a little bit of chlorine, it's not so efficient uh, for eliminating the All virus. Right. So also bean sprouts are a problem because you don't cook those, right? Yeah. Yep. So that's it. No more parsley, no more bean sprouts. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> raspberries. That's right. You don't cook raspberries. <laughs> no. Blueberries, all those kinds of fruits, right? But, uh, and yesterday we mentioned cabbage. If you make coleslaw, because the, the baculoviruses crawl uh, not the baculoviruses, viruses, the, the caterpillars crawl on the cabbage and they put ba uh, baculoviruses, so we can't get away from it. Um, so in places where, so this is an interesting issue because if it's expensive to decontaminate, many places are not going to do that, but also they may not even be processing sewage to use for irrigation. Yeah, yes, well... Uh, yeah, for the, we have, even in Europe, we had guidelines just in 2017. So it's not like we can say much about it. Irrigation water has been something that not, not so, nobody paid so much attention. Uh, but now, yeah, we realize the importance and it should be made in an easy way that make it feasible because, of course, not anybody cannot start doing microbiological test of every source of water, no? So we know that, for example, use of, of dirty water on farms can lead to E. coli outbreaks, right? Mm -hmm. we, we suspect that. Do we know of any case where there are viral outbreaks that may be traced to the use of gray water? Um, 
You mean from farms? Yeah, irrigation using reprocessed water, reclaimed yeah. water. Well, um, it's not so easy to get yeah. the trace, uh, some of the outgrades that have been described. But uh, sometimes it has been traced in imported food. Mm -hmm. And then with imported food, we knew that the regulations were not the same than in, we have here in Europe. Yeah. So if you import food from an endemic country for HEPA, you have more probabilities and even yeah, more. Yeah. You may not blame anybody because uh, it's not a ob legal obligation to test for hepatitis A each food uh, sample. So, you mm -hmm. know, we have been testing for E. coli and some bacterial pathogens, but testing for virus has been, uh, I mean, we don't have standards until really recently, a couple of years ago in Europe also. So in, I think in the U.S. we had a hep A outbreak mm -hmm. from salsa or something, but it may have been traced okay. to the use of reclaimed water. Okay. So there you, have been outbreaks with norovirus, with raspberries and oysters in Europe several times. That's right. Yeah. That's right, raspberries and oysters, yeah. So uh, do you think we need to have standards at some point? Uh, yes, I think so. And in fact, now we have sort of standards. And we have this double standard, the monitoring, which used to be a simple assay, but then you need the validation. And I think we need to do more work on the validation, validation of your system. All right. Uh, one more question I have for you. And uh, you uh, also looked in water for my favorite pathogen, prions. Yes. <laughs> Can you tell us what you found? Yeah, well, it's really difficult. Some experiments took like six years. <laughs> they are so stable. So yeah, I was really concerned with the prions because I had this sense that the planet is enriched and enriched and enriched on prions that stay there because they are not really degraded in soils and in many places, like Westin, uh, the Westin disease in, um, in the States. The deers, yeah. With the deer. Yeah. Uh, that's an example. You have more and more and more and more areas. And uh, so the prions are so stable, stable in soil that are 16, 15 years has been tested and they're still stable. Mm -hmm. We wanted to check in sewage also if was any, how can the wastewater treatment plants act for prions? And we did some assays of, <coughs> with BSC and uh, uh, scrapey. And stability at different temperatures in wastewater or in buffers. And we tested, if you test the prion protein, the resistant prion protein, you see a decay in, um, I will say in 100 days. So it depends on the samples. But then we find out that that's not a good marker for the decay of the prions. Because when we use um, transgenic mice to test prions with the gold standard assay, it was years and it was no changes in the, in the infectivity. So initially we still need to find a good marker. Uh, it's not, it's really a complicated issue. And I really worry because I still keep my sense that the planet is getting enriched and enriching prions <laughs> <laughs> and nothing destroys them. And, uh, and, but to work with prions is really difficult because everything takes so long if you really want to, to study. But there's a uh, kind of a PCR assay for proteins for prions, right? Yeah, very sensitive now, yes. It's, it makes you even more scary. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the, in the U.S., the, it's been, someone did a study showing if you put prions in the soil, it will go up into the plant and remain in the leaves, and you can feed the leaves or you can inject the leaves at least into mice and it will cause, oh. uh, you know, the, the disease. So, well, I, you may be wondering why we're talking about prions at a virology meeting. And uh, I teach prions in my virology course. My virology textbook has prions in it because they're fascinating. They're not viruses, but they're infectious proteins. And my class says after that lecture, they never eat beef again <laughs> because they don't want to get prion diseases even though they're very rare but they're fascinating yeah yeah that's interesting 
And so you're going to be do more, doing more prion work in, in no, the water? No, we don't do it now. You had we, enough for that. My students were really exhausted of uh, oh, So that drove it. Okay. So are you also interested in the potential identification of new viruses? If you do all these metagenomics, I'm sure you come across reads that look like viruses, but do you do follow-up work in that direction? Yeah, we always have um, these uh, in apart. We, we, we try to do that, yeah, in some strains, but uh, I don't have much, uh, we have no much success yet. Uh, because, you know, one of the problems with the metagenomics is that you get so much information that you don't have the time to analyze this information as you would like it. And uh, that's, a, that's an also another thing that is accumulating in the planet. It's a lot of <laughs> biome and sequence information. Sequences that, and prions, right? Yes, that's right. And nobody has the time to look at. I mean, how many labs, you know, that do metagenomics, they have no the time to look at the... So we, we have some of the our family, favorite families. They have been we have been doing some studies in some of them, but uh, still still there. Yes. Someone mentioned today the, the dark matter when you sequence, you get dark matter which you can't describe to a virus. Do you get a lot of that where you have sequence and you, it doesn't match with any virus? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's another. That's one of the reasons I think that we are building a nice database because yeah, yeah. we can come back later on sure. to this. Uh, but yeah, we have tons of uh, millions of sequences that doesn't seem similar to anything known. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that reminds me. Remember the the crass virus mm -hmm. that yes. was assembled. They, it was dark matter, but they were able to assemble the whole genome. And it turns out it's one of the most common in. Feces, right? Do you see that? Yeah. You must. Uh. Yes, yes. And uh, it's a really interesting topic with many papers suggesting interesting ideas and I don't know how of them really yeah. real. Can't beat the name, right? Sorry? It's a great name. Yes. <laughs> okay, Marie Paul, you, you were at a WHO Assistant Director General for Health Systems and Innovation, right? And, and you coordinated um, R&D efforts during the West African Ebola outbreak. Can you tell us a little bit? Because we have no idea what that means. Can you tell us what you did? Sure. I, I was wondering also which paper you would <laughs> try to <laughs> bring me on. Newspaper. Uh, you know, when I, and I was at WHO, I was, was responsible for health systems, so nothing to do with virology or vaccines whatsoever. But when uh, uh, the Ebola outbreak in, uh, in West Africa became really bad and uh, it happens during the summer of 2014 and many many people in WHO as elsewhere also wasn't were on vacation so I wasn't on vacation beginning of August and I was there and so I participated as one of a you know assistant director general of the organization and it was clear that uh, this was spiraling out of control and although you may, and I have uh, asked previously whether the people in charge of a response were anyway interested in research, uh, if it could help them, I was sent away saying, go away, you know, we have enough problem. Don't come with research, it's too late. Especially when we talked about vaccines, I have had friends from GSK calling and I've asked them, you know, where are you with your vaccine? And they say, oh, we have some experiment in animals. So this was in March. So, you know, March experience in animal and you think you can do something to have an impact on the epidemic was sort of very faint uh, uh, hope. So nevertheless, it, it was bad enough so that I, I requested from the director general, then uh, Dr. Margaret Chan, uh, that I was, would be allowed to lead the effort of the organization on, on, on trying to promote, push, facilitate research and development to try to use research to help fight this outbreak. So, um, and, and she accepted because I had previous exper experience in, in developing vaccines. So we, uh, we brought all the community together because WHO is not a research organization. We brought everybody together and consulted widely to see what were the drugs, the diagnostics, the vaccines, which were advanced enough uh, in order to uh, to be able to push them to, to to try to accelerate the research and development phase and 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 have something that could still have an impact 
And remember that in the early days of, uh, of autumn of 2014, there were this awful prediction uh, from CDC and others saying that by January 2015, there would be th millions of cases. So we identified a few drugs. Uh, we had also a few diagnostics and then I worked personally more on vaccines and we found that two vaccines were uh, advanced enough uh, so that they could right away start clinical trials in human. So these were the vaccine developed by uh, GlaxoSmithKline were well, based on, uh, on a chimpanzee adenovirus. And another one was developed by, by that time, by, had been developed by the Canadian uh, public health agency and had been sold to uh, a small biotech company called New Newlink, who had absolutely no idea of vaccines and no idea of doing anything outside the U.S. soil, and uh, and this was based on uh, on a VSV uh, recombinant virus expressing the Ebola glycoproteins. So these two were the only ones which were ready because there was human grade material available. So clinical, phase one clinical trial could start right away. So we, we put together two consortium, one to work with GSK, one to work with uh, Newlink, um, to start clinical trials immediately. So the first meeting that we had on this topic was in September. And in October, actually, we started the, the, the consortium on VSV. I'll only talk about this one now. I started clinical trials in, uh, in four sites. This is 2015 or 14? 14. 14. 14. So in a month. So this wow. was, it started in Geneva, in, uh, in, uh, in Germany, in Hamburg, in, uh, uh, then in, uh, in Gabon, uh, and uh, where was it? In Kenya. And so this means that in this month, not only did the investigators write the protocols, but the regulators reviewed the protocols, approved the protocols, they recruited people because it needed to be uh, in a hospital setting and to start the clinical trial. So impressive uh, acceleration due to the go all the goodwill of people seeing on the television these poor people dying in the streets, dying in ambulances. And so this was this accelerated path and, and these vaccines, uh, the GSK and the, and then it became Merck because May Merck got an interest, um, uh, went from phase one to efficacy trial phase three right away, beef, without any phase two data, because there were enough parallel phase one trial to have several hundred volunteers. Uh, there were several doses uh, experiments did in phase one to try to have a decent opinion of, of the dose and also a relatively good, well, as good as possible impression on safety. And we nearly had a disaster with the, the, the VSV vaccine, the Merck vaccine, because uh, the investigators, Clara and Sigrist in, in Geneva, uh, noticed, and it was a real, real fact, that actually the vaccine induced arthritis in a certain number of volunteers. So there was insert, uncertainty about safety, but it, after all, it was deemed to be good enough to, to start. So clinical trials started in February, March, uh, in, uh, first in Liberia, then in, uh, in Guinea, and also in, um, in Sierra Leone. And, um, and uh, the, the Guinea trial managed to uh, prove efficacy of, uh, of the vaccine, which were data were published in, uh, uh, in August 2015. So you can see that this is incredible, the, you know, the time compression, which is due not to WHO, is due to the, you know, to the coming together and the commitment of all these different groups, regulators, scientists, industry, who wanted to do something. And you were coordinating all this. Yes. And you're actually the senior author on that science paper, which uh, I had seen, uh, we read last. It's a Lancet paper. There's, a, there's also a science paper or no? Uh, no? Don't think so. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe you don't know. Anyway, I, I'll take your word for it. Um, I'm, I'm looking well, it up right now. <laughs> it's a Lancet paper. But um, th there was also an unusual trial design, kind of a modified ring. Yes. So how did that come about? Well, you know, the, 
when we started, we, WHO decided to start a consortium to work in Guinea because nobody else wanted to go into Guinea. Uh, there was a already a consortium to, uh, to work in Liberia with, uh, with the US NIH. It was a consortium to work in Sierra Leone with the US CDC and nobody wanted to work in, in Guinea. So the Guinean authority came to WHO and said, ah, we also want to be part of it. And so we assembled the unlikely consortium made of, you know, the WHO as a coordinator. We had MSF. Can you imagine? WHO and MSF. Usually they don't, what they talk one another is not that friendly. We had the government of uh, Norway, the government of uh, Canada, government of UK, money from the Wellcome Trust. And the investigators, Mike Levin and others, they were there on the whiteboard and say, what can we do that adds value to what the other guys are doing? In Liberia, they were doing a classical phase one, phase three, a, a placebo control, randomized clinical trial. Very beautiful, gold standard. In Sierra Leone, they were doing a cluster randomized in healthcare workers. And so discussion after discussion, somebody recalled uh, D.A. Anderson at the time of the eradication of uh, smallpox. Mm -hmm. And actually in the last days, you know, if you do vaccination campaign, mass vaccination campaign, you always miss the same people. So you use a lot of vaccine and, and, and still you don't vaccinate everybody. So what they did at that time is that they did ring vaccination. So they identify any new case of, of smallpox, why identified? They numerated and identified the contacts of this one case and the contacts of their contacts. And they, and they uh, vaccinated this group. This was a ring. And this interrupted transmission. So the idea was to do the same for Ebola in Guinea. So, but then if you do ring vaccination, you still need, this is a trial. So you need to have a control. So what they did, what they calculated in terms of, you know, the time to infection, all that, is that the, when any uh, of new infection was detected, there was numeration of the contacts and contact of, and of contacts. When the list was made and finished, the, the team there in the villages, because it was in remote places, called the center in, uh, in um, Conakry and asked for a randomization number. And the randomization number put this particular ring either in a ring which was vaccinated immediately or to a ring which was, would be vaccinated after 21 days. And then the, the game is to compare occurrence of new cases in the vaccinated immediately to the vaccination late. And this demonstrated initial data on high level protection. I, I remember that. And it, it, you didn't want to give placebo, right? No, no, no. <laughs> you know, this was not popular. It, there was huge discussion on that. But in Guinea, not that uh, much yeah. appetite yeah. for so you're right, it is a Lancet paper. Yes. My, it's the same red, red color of the headline as whatever, but yeah. Um, so you should know, obviously. So what's the status of this vaccine? Is it being used in the Well, DRC? this is, uh, first the vaccine is not yet licensed, but I hear from Merck that it should be licensed finally in, in next year. Okay, so still, uh, still, still the vaccine was used in West Africa in the context of uh, expanded access, as it's called, which is, it was used under a study, still not, not clinical trial, but study. This means that all the vaccinees needed to sign informed consent. And it was used to stop outbreaks due to um, uh, people who were, um, came out of Ebola, were cured from Ebola, and were still infectious. And it was very useful to stop all these small outbreaks. Now, when the, the big outbreak, the big epidemic that we have now, now in North Kivu and in Ituri started, uh, there was a decision to continue to use the same vaccine. So this vaccine is, is used there, the same condition, with informed consent. Um, so many people, some people say, many know, some people say, you know, ah, it's impossible, this informed consent and whatsoever. But what actually, what my ex-colleagues say is that, you, you know, these people, the contact and the contact of con contact, during the time of the um, informed consent seeking, this is the only time somebody talks to them about what is Ebola whatsoever. So they say that it's not a lost time. It's actually, you know, to have a population understand. And, uh, and for the timing, 100,000 people have been vaccinated, but unfortunately, it doesn't seem to do the trick quite. It has been quite good at the time. It was really diminishing. 
and they reduced the, the epidemic. But then there started to be more violence and burning of, and uh, these days it's more 20, between 20 and 30 cases per, per day. So it's not that good. So they still do the, vac the clinical trial, uh, the, the, sorry, the, the ring vaccination. Uh, and uh, and I'm sure that they are thinking about what else they can do to uh, to bring it under control. Mm. But now, since you're no longer with WHO, you don't have any connection with that anymore, right? No. Do you miss it? <laughs> you know, I of of course it's a, I miss some part of it. It was the most interesting job I could ever have uh, dreamt about having. But everything is a, has an end. When you come to the nice uh, at the end of a very interesting book, it's the last page, and this is the time to turn it and add more chapter. Doesn't add anything. So it was a part of my life, mm -hmm, sure. and I value this part, and I look forward to do other things. So you're now at Inserm, and what are you doing there? Oh, uh, at Inserm, I, I'm, I'm working with them on, uh, on forging international collaboration, especially with low-income countries. But I'm also the, the chair of a number of, of a board of a number of non-profit foundations. Uh, so I'm the chair of a, the medicines patent pool, which uh, is working to trying to get a um, lower price of, of essential medicine food generic competition. I'm also the chair of a board of DNDI, the Drug for Neglected Diseases Initiative, developing drugs against leishmaniasis, uh, sleeping sickness, and so on. I'm the, I'm the, in the board of a human vaccine project and others, so I have plenty of things to do. Now, I don't doubt it. <laughs> now, I, I notice you have some papers or some commentaries anyway on polio vaccines and i know there's a shortage of ipv which who wants to transition to so what's going to happen with that do you know well the uh, the production capacity actually for ipv is is increasing mm -hmm. so this is the first thing i was also when i was seated who chairing the the advisory committee for the development of sabine inactivated polio vaccine. Right, right. So the, the capacity is increasing and also um, the uh, eradication initiative has been successful in vaccinating with fractional dose of polio vaccine. So they've shown that uh, di diluting it by one fifth, like it was done for yellow fever, actually is very effective. So by uh, first there's an expansion and then the dilution makes it that although it's still uh, tense in terms of quantity, they, they manage to move forward. Mm, good. I remember in the 1980s, I used to work with Letterly. They were manufacturing Sabin, right? And they started a Sabin IPV program. You know this because you wrote about it. And um, they said Sabin visited once. And he said, you don't need to do that. Sabin OPV will be fine to eradicate. He, he, he never believed in his lifetime in vaccine-derived polioviruses. And uh, actually, this is a big problem for, for VDP2, for polio type 2. And th there are no epidemics uh, in Africa, in Nigeria, and uh, in DC, which are, um, which are not permanent, but take much too long time to get results. So there, clearly, there is a, a, a push to try sure. to eliminate OPV as much as possible. Do you think that at some point in the future, polio will be eradicated? You know, of course, we all hope, and I, I hope it will be the case. There are two, there are, well, one, one big issue is political. Uh, how will you, how can you vaccinate children at the border between Pakistan and Afghanistan? Uh, there's the danger to the vaccinator. There's the, the fact that uh, uh, at the end, when the political situation is very tense, um, both parties are using health matters as hostage. Uh, the Taliban have banned door-to-door -door vaccination now. Uh, so this is a political issue. So how much can this be resolved? It depends. Actually, interestingly enough, it depends often on people. So who will be the people who will be able to, you know, to step forward and, and help on that? And then the problem of VDPV is, is another problem, but this is more technical, and usually technical problem gets resolved. Mm. So if we can get over the people problem, then we could probably eradicate it. Probably. Because we've done it everywhere else, right? Yes. And if we can make more IPV, that's not a problem you have to worry about. You can never eradicate influenza virus. Nope, not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
All right, we are out of time. Do you have any more questions? No, not really. I think okay. it was a nice package, yeah. All right, that is TWIV. You can find it at microbe.tv slash TWIV. We always like getting questions and comments. TWIV at microbe.tv. Most of you probably listen on an iPhone or an Android or a tablet. Who listens to TWIV? Raise your hand. Okay, most of you do. You subscribe, right? Because right, we want you to subscribe. It's free and you get every episode automatically. And if you really like what we do, consider supporting us financially. We're a nonprofit organization, so we need your donations. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute. You could give us a dollar a month, be less than a cup of coffee, and you get not only four episodes of TWIV, but two of TWIM, two of TWIP, that's microbiology and parasitology. You get one on immunology, one on evolution. It's a, it's a great bargain for a buck a month. <laughs> Less, less than a euro a month. My guest today, my co-host, Ben Burkout, thank you so much for joining us. Your first TWIV. We'll have to ha come back sometime and you can talk about your work. Fine. All right. We do that. Ron Fouchier, welcome back. Thank you for coming again. It was a pleasure. And we'll see you another time. Rosina Gironis, thank you so much for joining us. And Anne Paul Keeney, thank you so much. An amazing career. I, I read your whole biography. You've done so many things. It's very cool. You know, that's the benefit of age. <laughs> You're only 40. Oof. <laughs> I want to thank uh, the European Congress of Virology for inviting us, particularly Marion Koopmans, who reached out to me. I want to thank ASV and ASM for their support and Ronald Jenkins for his music. What else do I have to do now? Is there anything else? Oh, shirts. Okay. Let me get some shirts. Give you oh. some T-shirts. So these are... Um, for the guests, these are special edition Whoa. TWIV World Tour. Wow. Last year, we went to all these places, including three in Europe, and I had this designed. So these are special edition. Yesterday, uh, Martin Beer, afterwards, he said, can I have one? <laughs> <laughs> but only the audience gets it. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Thank you.